Yeah, today we're going to do literature. Please leave your uh, cameras on. Don't turn them off unless you have a problem with your internet. You would have to let me know. Yeah, how are you today? All good? Yeah. Okay, it's Friday, so you're going to have weekend. That's nice. We're going to analyze the poem today. And as you know, next week is already test week, meaning that next week you have to submit your literary uh, analysis, your poll, uh, your poetry analysis of the poem. So <clears throat> let's get right to it. If, for example, you have any questions, please uh, just ask yeah, throughout the lesson. If there's something that is uh, confusing whatsoever, just um, ask throughout the lesson straight away. Now, I have given you a link. Everything is in your unit three schedule. I always put all the links in Google Slides or PowerPoints in the unit schedule. So it's an easy access for everyone, yeah? Um, now, looking at poetic devices, if you look at this file here, oops, let me go up. Yeah, poetry is the kind of thing poets write by Robert Frost. And man, if you've got to ask, you'll never know, Louis Armstrong. Okay, here it says that a poet is limited in the materials he can use in creating his works. All he has are words to express his ideas and feelings. These words need to be precisely right on several levels at once. Now, what are the most important parts of the poetic devices? How can we divide the poetic devices? We have literary devices, those are going more into stories, yeah? Literary devices are more the general devices that we use, but most likely more focusing on stories, whereas poetic devices, they, these are some of the devices that are very specific to poetry. We can basically um, put them into four groups. The first one we call uh, sounds, the sounds of words. Then we've got the meaning of words, we've got the arrangement of words, and we got the images of words, yeah? So they must sound right to the listener. Even as they delight his ear, they must have a meaning, which might have been uh, unclear, maybe not more implied rather than explicit, yeah? Uh, but seems to be the perfectly right one. They must be arranged in a relationship and placed on the page in ways that are once easy to follow. And they must probe to death, they must give death of human thought, human emotions, human empathy, while appearing simple, self-contained, and unpretentious. That mean unpretentious. Sorry. That means that those are the images of words. So that goes into sensory. Yeah, as in the sensory details. Yeah. Fortunately, the English language contains a wide range of words, so you can choose from. Uh, and there are also numerous plans of methods of arranging these words called poetic devices. So poetic devices assist the writer in developing the expression that is beautiful. Yeah, a lot of the poetry today is uh, silently. It must still carry with the feeling of being spoken aloud. A lot of the po poetry is written silently. Back in the day, in the old days, they would do a lot of out loud reading. Yeah. Um, but yet still, we have also up till today, uh, those events where you read poetry out loud. It's really nice though, because it's a very beautiful um, work of art. Now, I don't remember clearly, but wasn't it Kenas who likes poetry? Wasn't it Kenas who last year also all the time would say some poetry or something, I remember? Kenas! Wasn't you who like? Yeah, don't you like poetry? Poesi, bukanya kena suka poesi. Yeah. Yeah, kan? Yeah. Aku ingat lo. Hebat ya. Yeah, miss. <laughs> ingat lo aku. Karena kamu itu pas sastra selalu itu sebut-sebut bagus-bagus uh, uh, gitu lo. Ada aja yang kamu bilang. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so poetry. Aduh, sometimes it sounds complicated. 
you can't really get the literal meaning like that. You got to analyze it a bit, but it's beautiful work of art because it is very strong in emotion, right? So it's not only the words that you use, but also how you place them in the sentence and the rhythm that you create and the rhyming that you create and all that together uh, create, uh, creates an atmosphere of feeling and a deeper meaning. It's kind of cool. That would work. You, it's like painting a painting that is meaningful, but just with words. So sounds, rhythm, rhyme, yeah. And with the meaning of words, basically. It's kind of cool. Yeah. So the sounds of words, um, here it says words or portions of words can be clustered or juxtaposed to achieve specific kinds of effects. So the sounds of words create an effect. Yeah. Uh, it can become uh, to us as clever, as pleasing, as soothing. There's different ways of what it can do. Now. Um, what is important is how do we arrange the words? Now, the first one we look at for sounds of words is not only onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia are sound words, as in describing a certain sound of bure and blush and bass and buzz. You know, like those are sound words. But here we're talking about words or techniques basically that we use in order to create a certain sound. So alliteration is one, assonance and consonance. You know this because we already discussed this in year 10 and 11. <clears throat> As alliteration is the repeated consonant sounds at the beginning of the word. So those are the first letters like fast and furious, FF, where Peter and Andrew padded the pony. Yeah, so Peter and padded pony and Andrew and Ascot. So it's the first letter that is repeated. Assonance is repeating the vowel sounds in the words and they're placed near to each other. So, for example, he's a bruise and loser, bruise and loser. So, you have the same sound coming from the consonant, even though it's not spelled exactly the same, but it's about the sound, yeah. And we have the consonants, which is the repeated consonants sounds at the ending of words placed near to each other. So the alliteration is also consonant, but at the beginning, and then consonants is at the end. Here you have the example of goats. You have this material, yeah? It's in your unit schedule. For example, boats into the past or cool soul. So it's at the end of the word that you hear the repetition of the word, yeah? Ah, cacophony. Harsh, unpleasant sounds, which help to convey disorder. Uh, it gives an effect of the meaning and the difficulty of pronunciation, yeah. Like my stick fingers click with the snicker. And chuckling, they knuckle the keys. It's more you have to think of it when you pronounce that. We also have you, uh, you, you funny, musical pleasant sounds. Yeah, then ores divide the ocean to silver for a seam. It's very soothing. Onomatopoeia, sound words, as you know. Yeah. Boom, buzz, crackle, gargle, hiss, pop, sizzle, snap, swoosh, whir, zip. Repetition, of course, when you repeat the words. I was glad. So very, very glad. Right? Or rhyme. Now, when we come to rhyming, we have different rhyme schemes. You remember this. Most of this you've already had last year. The vice commonly associated with poetry is rhyming because that's what we often do in po poetry. So um, words that have different beginning sounds but whose ending sounds are alike. For example, times, line, mine, double rhymes. Then we have double rhymes, which includes the final two syllables. Example is revival, arrival, survival. So in single rhyme would be only the last uh, part vowel sounds rhyming, but with double rhymes, you can have two syllables like I vol, I vol, I vol in this case, and you have triple example greenery, machinery. So it's three. Interesting, yeah. Hello, Georgian. Okay, now so those are the rhymes, and then you have rhythm, that is another thing. Uh, the rhythm, how a pattern of how it is written. So the seldom uh, the general public seldom directly is conscious of rhythm. Yeah, you just kind of respond to it by itself. 
but it is um, very purposefully created, okay? So rhythm helps you to distinguish poetry from prose, okay? A pro is just a reading, a text, but a poem is not just a text, it's different, right? It's not. The rhythm sets it apart. I thought I saw a pussy cat. Yeah, so you see where the emphasis lie on, yeah? So patterns mostly are referred to meter. Yeah, we have rhyme scheme and the rhythm is the meter. So these are the different things. We talked about this also last year. So the organization of voice patterns, yeah? How they are repeated. Okay, and then we have here, Different patterns, different meters, monometer, dimeter, trimeter, tetrameter, pentameter, hexameter, heptameter, and octameter. So different uh, ways of how to rhyme it. And then we've come to the meaning of words. Now, what are the meaning of words? Yeah. Now, words can mean several things. They have shades of meaning, so multiple meanings. Yeah. Now, it's the poet's job to find words which are used in relation to other words in the poem and carry the precise meaning, yeah? So we have um, different ways in which the meanings of words are used. For example, you can an allegory, you can use allusion, ambiguity, analogy, apostrophe, cliche, connotation, underlying emotional meaning, contrast, denotation is the literal meaning, uh, euphemism, when you shade things and kind of cover them up, make them seem less offensive, offensive. hyperbole, irony metaphor, metonymy, oxymoron, paradox, personification, pun, simile, symbol, uh, synecdote. And then you say, Miss Sylvie, are these not the figurative, lang the figurative language? Yes, 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 they are. They create a figure of speech, yeah? So these are also parts of figurative language, basically. Yeah, that falls under the meaning of words. Yeah, and then we come to the arrangement of the words. Now they have a certain sequence, which is determined by the poet. Yeah, um, there's various ways of organizing words that have been identified. For example, the author's point of view. Yeah, so it focuses on who's telling the story who is telling the poem, we have first person and third person. So first person, the speaker is a character in the story or third person limited. The speaker is not part of the story, but tells from the other characters, though through the limited perception of one person. That means if it's the third person limited, it's only from one character told. If it's third person omniscient means it's told from all the characters. Yeah, so limited one character, omniscient means all characters. Then we've got a line, fundamental line, one line of the words that we have. Yeah, the length of each line is determined by convention. In modern poetry, the poet has more latitude for choice, so mostly they have sometimes very short, sometimes very long. Verse is one single line of a poem arranged in a metrical pattern. It's a piece of poetry. Uh, such as a free verse, blank verse, yeah. And we have stanza, it's like a paragraph, several lines, stanza forms, uh, different forms of stanza. You have the one that is called uh, couplet, that's two lines. If it's only one line, that's yeah, a line, yeah. Uh, so the number of lines in the stanzaic unit, so two lines would be couplet, three lines to set, four quatrains, five quintet, six sestet. Seven septet and eight octave. It's one is just a line. Yeah. And then rhetorical question, rhyme scheme, as I said just now already. Enjambment, that is when you have a mixture in your logical sense. Uh, the grammatical construction beyond the end of the line of poetry is sometimes done with the title. Enjambment is where it kind of overlaps and it creates a certain effect. Yeah. Um, now we've got form, different forms is the arrangement or the method used. So different forms are different types or 
different forms is actually different ways on how the poem is structured. It can be open, yeah, um, it can be closed, it can be a blank verse, it can be a free verse, couplet, whole heroic couplet or quatrain, or a fixed form can be like a type as a ballad or ballet or concrete poetry, epigram, epitaph, haiku, limerick, lyric, oda, um, pantone, rondo, sestina, sonnet, Shakespearean sonnet, Italian sonnet, Spencerian sonnet, sonnet sequence, and triolet and villanelle. So these are just different types of poems, okay? Just so you know. Then we come to the images of words. That's very important that it creates a certain image that you get that imagery going in the reader's head. So yeah, we built imagery. And to do that, uh, we use figurative language, which, which was already placed above that talks of the meaning, the underlying meaning and imagery for which we use multiple adjectives to appeal to our senses as sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. Yeah. We have synesthesia, which is fusing different senses all together. This is very interesting because you can have here an example of the sound of a voice with sweet. Like sound goes, sound of her voice goes to hearing, sweet goes to taste. Or a loud aroma, a velvety smile. Loud is the sense of hearing, aroma is the sense of smell. A velvety smile would be sight. So we've got, we've got here uh, hearing, smell, and sight all in one. It's so interesting. And of course, we have tone and mood. Yeah, how the poet reveals attitudes and feelings. Uh, tone and mood. Tone shows attitude, mood shows feelings. It's a style of language or expressions or thoughts used to develop the subject, yeah? So that is very important. So these are just, um, these are the basic fundamentals. This is the basic fundament of poetic devices. Don't have to remember that. I'm not asking you to memorize that, but I'm just asking you to read through it to understand, okay? Now, we're gonna go to the poem and you're gonna tell me what it means. Ore, ore, short summary, just before we get into that, get ready because you guys have to tell me what the poem means. The speaker describes hope as a bird, the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. There it sings wordlessly and without pause. The song of hope sounds sweetest in the gale, and it would require a terrifying storm to ever abash the little bird that's kept so many warm. So the speaker says that she has heard the bird of hope in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, but never, no matter how extreme the conditions, did it ever ask for a single crumb from her. So it was there, really, really humble and not asking for anything. Now, if we're looking at the form, like almost all of Dickens' poems, hope is the thing with feathers takes the form of an, uh, we called it iambic trimeter. So in this case, um, uh, that it expands to include a fourth stress at the end of the line. So you get an extra a fourth stressor. It says here, as in, and sings the tune without the words. Sings the tune without the words here. And then you have this M dash to pause. Like almost all of her pose, it modifies and breaks up the rhythm flow with long dashes. Yeah, indicating a long break and a pause and never stops at all. So the stanzas, as in most of Dickens' rhy uh, lyrics, rhyme loosely, mostly goes with A, B, C, B. Do you remember the rhyme schemes? A, A, B, B, C, C, A, B, A, B. This one is A, B, C, B, yeah? So that's, and, and in the end, or at the point, the letter point, it goes like A, B, B, B. So yeah, I don't know if you remember that from last year. Last year, we talked about all these rhyme schemes, yeah? And for Dickinson, most of her are taken from a lot of uh, parts from the Bible. In this case, it really uh, is derived from Psalms, yeah? Uh, psalms and religious hymns, which are taken from the Bible. Okay, I'm going to start up and ask 
Uh, let me see who we are going to ask first. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Ophi, I'm going to ask you, what does the first line mean? Hope is the thing with feathers. Ophi. Yes, miss. What does it mean? Hope is the thing with feathers. Um, I'm not really sure, miss. Oh, no, 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 no. You cannot answer that. You have to answer something. You had a whole week to read it. So you cannot say, I don't know, and I'm not really sure. You have to come up with an answer. Come on. I do not take no for an answer. What does it mean? It's up to you. It's your interpretation of it. Your interpretation can never be wrong. Well, what is your interpretation of hope? It's the thing that fetters. And then as you pay attention, the word hope is set off with quotation marks. Ophi, to you, what does it mean? Come on. Okay, Sarah, what does it mean? Hope is the thing with feathers. Uh, I think hope uh, uh, in this home, hope is symbolized like a bird. It is very good. And what is the evidence to that? Uh, the thing with feathers. Yeah, very good. So why is it not a chicken then? Because in the uh, third line, it says sings the tune and bird like, yeah, like to sing, like to sing, like to sing in the morning. Very good. I uh, have never uh, heard a chicken sing a beautiful tune in the morning. It is not that beautiful. <laughs> Okay, cool. Very good. Thank you. See, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear, you can say it from what your perspective is, as long as you come up with evidence. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, Fanya, that purchase in the soul, what does that mean? And you can connect that to the former sentence or to the next sentence. That's, that's cool. That purchase in the soul, what does that mean? That's how you mean. Yeah. Okay, but in English. Hmm. Try it in English. If it's hard, uh, you can use Bahasa. It means. That uh, hope is very meaningful. Uh, it relates to the soul. Yes, but why? Why in the soul? Uh, because maybe soul is like feeling. Okay. So hopeful feeling. Yeah. Do you know what purchase means? No. Can you look it up and tell me what it means? Please Google it. What's purchase? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, a brand. Huh? A brand. Yeah, so when you, what does a bird do when it perches? Uh, they rest. Yeah, so they are really, they're like um, perching means like, you know, when a, when a bird is like nesting on a branch. So basically, that would say that that's their home, right? They're like making their home. It's where they feel comfortable. It's, it's their place. So if we're establishing that hope is a bird, and so hope as a bird is nesting in our soul. Wow. What, what, what does that mean? Thank you. 
uh, Amel, what does that mean to you? So whole purchase in your soul. So I, like there's like hope is like the bird, and when the bird perch, it just stays in that place. So like hope, it stay, uh, it stays in our soul. There will always be hope for us. Yeah. Oh, so cool. Yeah. If you relate that to a biblical view uh, in the Bible, who represents hope for us? Amel. Uh, Jesus. Jesus does because he's the way. He's the way. We can't go to heaven without Jesus. Exactly. The way, the truth, and the life, right? And what does the Bible tell us about where Jesus is? If you receive him, where is he? Uh, in, in our heart. Very good. So even the Bible teaches us Jesus, which is the way, the truth, and the life. As you said, without him, we can't reach to the Father. He's the hope and our salvation. So, and he lives within our heart and in our soul. So even if we look at the biblical viewpoint, it's Jesus perching in our soul. He has made our heart, our soul, deep down within us, his resting place. And he will never leave. The Bible says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And that is a constant, not only knowledge, understanding, but a constant truth that he will always be there. So if you look at hope in this sense, it's very similar. That if it is in the soul means it doesn't waver. It doesn't stumble. Even it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Hope is still there. It's very powerful. Thank you. Lau, what do you think about and sings the tune without the words? It never stops at all. Sings the tune without the words. So like, as we know, since hope, since we're saying that hope is kind is similar to like a bird, right? And birds sing without tunes and that's hope also sings without it sings without words, right? So hope is also something that sings a, a, tune, a tune without the words, where, you know, hope doesn't really, like, have, like, any explanation of, like, why. It just, it's just, it it's just there. makes, like, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Your background is cool. <laughs> makes me want to go to the beach, man. <laughs> Okay, when you have your background with yourself, I always get confused whether my eyes are not in place or what. Like, am I seeing double right now? <laughs> but the beach works. <laughs> okay, I would like to dig a little bit. That was a good explanation. Thank you, guys. I would like to dig a little bit deeper about without the words. Words are exact and words are precise. Words bring a message which is clear. What about if you only hear the sweet tune but you don't hear the words, what would that refer to? Audrey? Why only the tune and not the words? Words make it clear, right? If it's a tune, da, 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 da. it's just a tune, it's a melody. But if I put words to it, it becomes exact, it becomes precise. Why, is, why no words? For, for me, I, this is just my opinion, but I kind of like get the feeling that it's something that wants to be said but can't hmm. in a way that they're trying to say it out loud, but they don't have the, what do you call that? The freedom to say it oh, wow. in a way. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, the bird can't say words, but yeah, it's as if it is incapable of saying it. But the message is clear within the melody and the tune that it sings. Yeah, that could also be related to our circumstances. Do we need hope when everything goes easy and well, guys? Clara, do we need hope when everything goes well? Um... I think the majority of people will think that we need hope mostly when things are bad. Hmm. Now, if but, things, let me ask on, go, continue on that. So if it is hard, if life brings hardships, that's where hope really is important, right? Now, in hardships, 
do we already know the outcome? Do we know the outcome of the trouble? Do we know what will happen? Are we, are we aware of everything? No. No. Therefore, yeah, therefore we need hope. That's, this, yeah, go on. Uh, the hope is the thing that makes us strong in those hardship. If not, we're going to be despair and I think fail. Yeah, give up. Yeah, exactly. So is it safe to say then that when it says it sings to tune without the words because we don't know the outcome of things, but the tune of hope resides within us? No worries, because we don't know the outcome. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. But you just hope for that what is, which is unseen. Miss, I'm sorry, putus putus. Mm. So what I'm saying is like um, to redefine without the words, right? Like <clears throat> it is only a tune without the words. As we can say, words are precise, exact and clear. But in a circumstance, as you said yourself just now, in a circumstance where we have difficulties, we need hope, right? Now, it's in a time of difficult where we don't have the words because we don't know how to solve it yet. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know how it will finish. Mm -hmm. But you just hope for the best, right? Mm -hmm. So that is as if it resembles the melody and the tune, but the words aren't there. But the hope is the melody that carries the whole circumstance or carries you through the circumstance, even though you don't have the exact words for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Because if you would know, you wouldn't need hope, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, awesome. I like how you explained it. Never stops at all. But Clara, how does that work then? So it sings the tune without the words, but it never stops at all. Never stops at all. That's how it's with the pauses. Yeah. So? Yeah, so it never stops at all. So, mm, it never stops. It just never stops because basically human needs hope to be alive. Hmm. To stay alive. I think if hope would stop then we're dead right okay cool love that not the dead part but <laughs> the analogy of it awesome so cool okay michelle i'm gonna ask you and sweetest in the gill is heard what does that mean Michelle, Michelle, okay, SD, SD, okay, L, yes. Can you leave your camera on, Andre Gilbert? Shani, Livia, Albert, Georgian, Arjun, you see, Genas, Jerry, whoever can turn on. Come on, you guys can turn on your cameras, turn it on. Oh, can you answer? What does it mean? And Swedish and the Gill is heard. What is Gill? If you don't know, look it up. Um, Gill is basically you know, like a strong wind. Yeah. So like, and the sweetest, the sweetest refers to the, um, to the, to the words, mm -hmm. to the, yeah. The tune, yeah. And in the gale is heard. So even though in, like in the strong wind, it, it, it still can be heard, you know. In That's strong, powerful. Yeah, in the strongest uh, challenge, it still can be heard. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that that, that gale really represents a very strong circumstance so it could also be it could be if it's the strongest storm or winds it could be the hardest even in the hardest part of life with the hardest of circumstances right yeah awesome beans cool um i'm gonna ask jerry
So I'm going to write down names of people who are absent, yeah? Jerry, no response, so absent. Can us? You see? Arjun? Georgian? Albert? Yes, please. Okay, can you explain the next one? And sure must be the storm. The storm must be storm. Uh, uh, can I googling and yes. try? Yes, of course. Storm must be the storm. Uh, Livia, can you do the next one? That could bash the little bird. Livia? Shani? Yes, miss. Shani, can you do the next one? That could have bashed the little bird. Oh, okay. Think about it. I'm going to ask Albert first and then you, yeah? Okay, Albert, what is it? Mm. Sore must be the storm. Sore means painful. What do you think, Albert? <clears throat> yeah. Albert, can you turn on your camera, please? Also, Shani, Livia, all of you, please turn on your camera. Albert, what's the answer? I'm still waiting. Mm. <clears throat> Maybe the storm is uh, describing the the problem of our life and uh, the the uh, the sore is the painful that we have in our problem that make us uh, believe that we have to do something. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. Shani? Shani? Yes. Can you answer? Um, a bash means like hurt or something like hurt um ashamed a bash like ashamed um so little the little bird maybe means like um something that pure and full of hope like that maybe you can connect it to the former line so even if the storm is very painful and very difficult, it says the word could. So it does not, it could. Could means there is a possibility, but it does not necessarily. So if we're saying a sore and sore must be the storm, hardships at what, what um, Albert just explained, that could have bashed a little bird, a storm difficulty that could make the bird give up or ashamed or you know hurt and then that kept so many warm in comparison to that fell in what do you think that means uh the little bird miss hmm? and or that, that kept, kept so many warm so that could have asked the little birds it kept so many warm so the bird uh 
uh, giving a warm is like giving a hope or something that make us comfortable. Maybe. Yeah, that gives warmth, right? Yeah. Cool. I've heard it in the chillest lands and on the strangest sea. Patma. Gilbert? Yes. What does it mean? Um, um, um. I, I'm not sure. I don't really understand poems. That's not a good answer. Yeah, I know. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea. What did, what does it talk about? Heard what? The tune, the, the, the tune that the bird sings. And which is? Hope. Hope, yeah. There's always a way to respond, okay? There is no such thing as I don't really know. Right. Amel, what do you think it means? I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea. So like chill and strangest is like two different adjectives, you know, to describe something and land and sea also like opposites. So like hope can be heard even in the furthest land, like from one point to another, which is like far away from one another, but hope can still be heard like all the way. Yeah, awesome, cool. Yet never in extremity, it asks a crump of me. Belinda? What does that mean? Yet is a contrast. A signal of contrast. And yet, never in extremity, it asks a crump of me. What does that mean? If you've heard it in the chillest lands and in the strangest seas to the farthest ends of the world in any situation, in any circumstance, it is always there. It is always there to keep us warm. The hope is always there to ignite a fire, always there to strengthen us, always there to push us forward wherever, whenever, however, whatever, Yet never in all its extremity, in all the extreme circumstances, in all these difficulties, it asked a crump of me. What does that mean, Belinda? Uh, I think even though we are facing, yeah. Coba pakai bahasa kalau mau. It asked to come from me, that's personification. A bird can't ask. Hope can't ask, right? Ask is a human trait, so that's called personification. Personifying this bird or hope as to be a human. A crumb, what does that resemble a crumb? A crumb of bread? What does that resemble a crumb? Anything in need, anything in return? Uh, uh, yeah? Uh, the I think hope never asks us for anything. Yeah, it never asks anything in return. Very good. So it means it is very genuinely giving without expecting anything back. Yeah, good. Now, if we, if we connect that again with the Bible and as Jesus being our hope, that's totally right because Jesus died on the cross to restore the relationship so we could have eternal life and have a relationship with the Father in heaven, therefore giving to the extreme everything, 
and not asking anything back in return because Jesus, our God himself, never counted the cost, never did cost and benefit. Always gives, never asks in return. So that is the heart of our father as well. And that is how hope in this case is represented. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes to look at what you are going to do because you're going to write an essay on this poem, which is also an important graduating score. So it's important that you write it well. Just as a reminder, remember that your journal, your log, and this essay are your portfolio for your graduating, final graduating score. So you don't get um, a remedial, right, for your Ujam Skola. That's why your portfolio is very important. Yeah. <clears throat> I already uploaded it, so if you go to uh, Moodle, you go to literature, then you will see uh, that you go down and it says poetry analysis essay or literary analysis essay. Go there, click it, and you will see uh, the link, the explanation, and the link of the Google form. Click the link, and it brings you to where you need to upload your essay. Yeah, so what is the title's meaning? Explain what the meaning is of the title. And then you explain the significance of the title in relation to the poem. So you have to explain in the first body paragraph what the title means. And in the second body paragraph, you have to explain how this title is strongly connected to the meaning of the poem. Basically, you're explaining what the poem means here. And then you make a conclusion. This is what I want to see. I don't need your outline. I just need your essay. That's it. Okay. But this is how you would have to organize your ideas. Okay. Give the overview. Give the thesis. In your introduction, you place the name. Your hook can be the name of the poem. Yeah. Uh, in the overview, write down who wrote the poem. Give some bridging. And then your thesis statement. Yeah, make sure you get that all in it. So you're basically analyzing what the title means and how the title is strongly related to the meaning of the poem. Okay? Cool. And here there is, I give you a link on how to write uh, a literary analysis. <clears throat> you can just read through that uh, to know um, what the components are of a literary analysis. Basically, you're analyzing the meaning, why it is written the way it was, and you look at every aspect. So it's important to still have your thesis statement and all that. So just read through that. I've given it to you. You can just read through that to have further information. If you are still confused, you can definitely ask me and I will help you out, okay? Anything you'd like to add? Um, yes, Pelin? Uh, where do we submit the literary analysis? When or where? Uh, where? Ah, I just said that. Uh, let me repeat. That is in Moodle. You go to literature. And there you have already the announcements. I already placed that since two months ago. So you have the um, announcement there. There you do it. You, mu you must click it. You see the explanation and you see uh, the Google form link. Yeah, so you submit it inside the Google form. Only the essay, eh? not the outline. The outline is written there just so you know how to organize your essay. Anyone else just now? Who else? Ms. Olvi. Yeah. Uh, when should we submit it, the literature essay? Yes. Uh, OK, that's in your unit schedule. Here, same date as the rest. So that is all for IPA on Monday. Yeah, this has been here for two months already, yeah? Sudah udah dari dua bulan lalu, yeah? So, yeah. For IPA, it's on the first of month. It's next Monday. Yeah? So remember, uh, you will have unit three tests Listening and speaking, unit three, test reading and writing. Look at the vocab and grammar at the back of your textbook. Yeah, submit your log in your journal. 
remember your speaking test, your video link goes inside your log, okay? And remember to have finished all the ebook activities because I checked and so many of you have not done it. Maybe only 20% did it. That's sangat sedikit. Yeah? So listening one, listening two, focus on speaking, video comprehension, reading one, reading two, focus on writing, which should have already been done through the last two months. So make sure it's done because this is your final grade. It's up to you. You want to graduate, then you should do everything and give it on Monday because if it's not, I deduct points. Then tidak ada remedy lagi. Ini saja. So if you don't do this, ya udah. Yeah, remember that, understand that. No postponing, okay? Because also your journey and your luck in your literary analysis are your portfolio. There's no other perbaikan nilai. Hanya ini, okay? Just reminding you again, especially for those who are mostly late, okay? So do it on time, you'll be fine. Do it late. That's worrisome, okay? Cool. Okay then, thank you very much. God bless you, have a great weekend. If you stumble upon questions, just ask me, don't worry. In the introduction for your poetry analysis, just write the title, who wrote it, a little bit of background. And then your, your thesis, you just write, uh, you mentioned that you analyze the title and the title in relation to the meaning of the poem. Remember that the thesis always introduces what you are about to discuss. So basically the essay question just is restated in your thesis statement, but paraphrased with different words. Okay. Cool. Okay, guys. God bless you. Bye-bye.